will be discussing special theory of relativity special theory of relativity okay so as an introduction i'll just say that a special theory of relativity is actually a theory of the structure of space time we'll see what these things mean okay structure of space time right okay. or in other words it says that not space but space time all right it says that space time has a specific geometry okay space time has a geometry right and uh, this geometry is called as minkowski geometry minkowski geometry all right so through special theory of relativity actually what einstein did was to understand that special theory of relativity says that uh, by through special theory of relativity einstein realized that space time has a specific structure right so special theory of relativity actually gave us the structure of space time or the geometry of space time hey, what do you mean by the term geometry right that term is not very difficult to understand all right okay we don't go into too many details but here what we mean is that so suppose you take a plane all right you take a plane and you have something like that all right say dx this is dy and then let's say this is ds all right then we know that ds square is equal to square root of dx square plus dy square sorry ds square is equal to dx square plus dy square this is just the pythagoras theorem right okay and this equation all right usually we'll uh, this equation which tells us how to measure the length between two points in a given space right this equation will refer to as the geometry as the geometry so this equation of the pythagoras theorem gives you the geometry of flat space okay in this case it is flat two dimensional space right so this equation okay this equation is what we call as the geometry and this is what we refer to as the geometry it how do you obtain the length between two points in a given space okay Uh, and that uh, that depends on the geometry in this case this is this is a very simple example the pythagoras theorem it's known as a geometry of two two dimensional flat space okay flat space <clears throat> and such a geometry is known as euclidean geometry euclidean geometry okay now this can be directly generalized to three dimensions in that case you will have if you have two points d a square is equal to d x square plus d y square plus dz square all right this is known as the uh, geometry of the three dimensional euclidean space so three dimensional uh, flat euclidean space okay that's a, this is a flat space okay and this uh, quantity we call as the geom or this uh, the 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 way you know, right the geometry means how how can you obtain the relation between two points or the distance between two points okay all right so if you know how to find the distance okay if you have a notion of distance between two points then you say that you have the geometry of that particular space right and in special theory of relativity but we'll be coming to these things here i'm just clarifying this term geometry okay but uh, later on we'll see that space time has a specific geometry and there's a similar equation all right space time is actually it is four dimensional it has three dimensions of space and one dimension of time there's three dimensions of space and one dimension of time all right and in, in as we go on we'll see that in four dimensional space we can actually uh, see a similar relation for the distance between two points all right so this four dimensional space and one dimensional time it's called as space time or we can simply call it as four dimensional minkowski space okay you can call it a four dimensional minkowski space all right so the space uh, that that term is uh, used in different sense sometimes it's used to uh, say that we are talking about the space or that three dimensional space alone okay sometimes it's uh, it, it also stands for see if you have a set of things then you say that it's a space or that is talk about hilbert space etc like that okay so this four dimensional three dimensional space or it is sometimes called three plus one dimensional space time or you can say three plus three plus one dimensional space all right so if you include time it has a certain relation like this and that's the reason for uh, 
uh, all the uh, special relativistic effect, including you know, time dilation, length contraction, etc. Right? So we are going to uncover this particular geometry in a way where right? we'll understand this particular geometry. But we'll start from the beginning before uh, understanding uh, what we mean exactly by these things. Okay, we'll uh, get from the beginning. All right, I'll just give you the thing so that you are, I'll jump, jump ahead and give you the thing. So if you, if uh, t x y and z right if t x comma y comma z are the coordinates of the four dimensional space okay the geometry is given by this it's dt square dt square minus dx square minus dy square minus dz square all right or the other way but it can be minus here and the plus on the other side okay depends on a convention so you may say that this uh, t and x are different units so you may have uh, a constant here or not, okay, depending on the unit. You can choose a unit system where this constant is one. So it's actually this. Okay. So you see that this is similar to the, the, the what do you say, the Pythagoras theorem. Okay. Except that, see what you have here is just the Pythagoras theorem, dx square plus dy square plus dz square, right? This is just the three dimensional Euclidean thing. And you see that this can be called as the uh, space separation, space separation and this is called the time separation all right now this equation we'll see later i'm just giving you giving it to you as an introduction so that you're familiar this equation gives us the geometry of space time right? that's what we are going to understand in this uh, in in this in the following sessions right but we'll start from the beginning we'll start from the beginning it's good that you 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 just think about this all right it's good to be familiar with this particular combination of uh, time and space coordinates Okay. All right. <clears throat> if you have any question, you can just ask in between. All right. Okay. So we, all right, let's not, now let's start at the beginning. Let's uh, see how Einstein came to this particular conclusion that the space time has a geometry, etc. All right. Okay. So let's talk. So an important thing in physics is the notion of a reference frame, a reference frame. Okay, a reference frame. You know what a reference frame is. For example, if you need to locate a point on this board, you need two coordinate systems, right? Okay, so you can choose some reference frame. Or you can align your coordinates with a particular reference frame. Maybe you can take the edge of this board, all right? You can, you can take these two edges of this board and say that this is my coordinate system. And using this coordinate system, once you fix the coordinate system, any point on this uh, space can be located by two numbers, right? You just give X and Y. By two numbers, you can locate this particular point. Similarly, in three dimensions, you will have three numbers, X comma Y comma Z, all right? This is what you call as a reference frame. And in, in relativity, we also sometimes call it as an observer, right? So in, in a relativity problem, we talk about an observer, etc. But actually we are talking about, when we say observer, we actually mean a reference frame, all right? Now, sometimes this is not enough because sometimes we need to see, uh, usually why we need a coordinate system is to follow a particle in space, for example. Right? So you need to know at what point it will be at, at, at what particular time. Right? So generally you also need a clock, okay, you, along with this uh, coordinate system. So you, you, you can consider this as a combination, uh, an orthogonal combination of three rods and a clock. Okay, you can construct such a coordinate system. Right? <clears throat> So this is what you mean by a reference frame. Okay. All right. But we there is an, in mechanics there is a special class of reference frames known as inertial reference frames. Inertial. Let's just say inertial reference frames. Okay. Inertial reference frames. Okay. And in mechanics, this inertial frames uh, in classical mechanics, this inertial frames. Or, or at least in Newtonian, but right? in Newtonian mechanics, this inertial frames has a special role. It has a special role also in special relativity. Okay, also in special relativity. All right. Now, what do we mean by inertial frames? All right, you can just start by a simple definition, which is rather incorrect, but I'll just give it to you. It's a frame okay. in which, uh, all right, uh, the frame at rest, <coughs> at rest, or constant uniform motion. Right? So what does this mean? It's a bit problematic, but this says that if you have one frame which you identify as an inertial frame, 
okay all other frames which are moving at a constant speed with respect to it are also inertial frames all right but how do you identify whether it's at rest or not right so this this definition is not sufficient usually we, we talk about this definition a better definition is to say that an inertial frame is one in which newton's first law is valid okay newton's first law is valid and what's newton's first law newton's first law say that says that if there is an external force acting on a particle or a body then it remains at rest or uh, in constant uniform motion right along a straight line etc right? that's the newton's first law of motion okay so you can identify an inertial frame if you are in a frame you can just identify an inertial frame by using some test particles all right or some objects so you look at these objects, you drop certain balls or you throw some balls, et cetera, and you look at these objects, and if they are at rest or at constant uniform motion in your reference frame, then we say that this is an inertial frame. Okay? Now, once you identify one inertial frame, there are inertial, all other frames which are moving at a constant speed with respect to it are also inertial frames. Okay. So there are, there are there's a difficult, more difficult question whether, whether there are actually inertial frames, but let's assume that such inertial frames actually exist, all right? In special relativity, assume that such inertial frames actually exist. Is that, is that clear? All right, so the inertial frame is one in which Newton's first law is valid. Yes, okay. So if without any force acting on it, without any force acting on it, uh, the, the particles should not start simply accelerating. And usually we attach our coordinate system to a train in, in special relativity, either when we talk about we attach our coordinate system to a train or a bus, okay, or to a platform, we can take, this is called as a body of a reference, all right, you can attach your coordinate system to any rigid body. So we also have non inertial frames, which are not relevant in uh, special theory of relativity, but we have to talk about it. What happens in non inertial frames? Okay. Suppose you have got a bus that's accelerating in this way. And if you choose this bus as your coordinate system, right? you're choosing this bus as your coordinate system. And if you have a test particle there, right? when the bus accelerates forward, you'll see that this particle accelerates backwards. So with respect to this bus, okay, with respect to this bus, you'll see that the, these particles are accelerating backwards without any external force acting on them, right? There is no external force acting on these particles, but with respect to this bus, these are accelerated, all right? So we say that this bus is not an inertial frame if it's accelerated. And so acceleration uh, does not makes your frame non-inertial, right? Rotation, all sorts of acceleration make your frame non-inertial, okay? And we see that Newton's laws are not valid in the same way in, in accelerated frames. If there's acceleration, you'll have to uh, uh, not talk about some fictitious forces or pseudo forces, okay? These things are there, all right. That's non-inertial frame. Now we said that we have identified inertial frames. Okay, we have identified inertial frames. And even though the identification is a bit tricky, we know that if you have one inertial frame, uh, you can find infinite other inertial frames because all frames which are traveling at a constant speed with respect to your identified inertial frame is also an inertial frame, right? All frames moving at a constant speed with respect to this inertial frame. Suppose you have identified an inertial frame, okay? An inertial frame. are also inertial frames. Okay, now the, the next question comes, how do you connect the coordinates between these inertial frames? Well, I suppose you have two different inertial frames. You have one inertial frame like that. Okay, you have got one inertial frame and you know the coordinates are X, Y, and Z. Right, and you also have uh, another inertial frame because you identify another inertial frame which is moving at a constant speed. Okay, let's say it's moving at a speed v. Let's talk about uh, this part point being here. Okay, so in this s frame, s frame, it has x comma y comma z. Right, in this s prime frame, this is called an s prime frame. We have identified that this is also an inertial frame. It is the coordinates are 
x prime, y prime, and z prime. All right. So the choice of coordinate system is not unique. You can choose any coordinate system, and accordingly, your coordinates will change. Okay, because there's nothing really physical about the coordinates. These are just numbers that you use to locate your object in the given uh, reference frame. Yeah. The next question is, how are these coordinates related? How are coordinates in different inertial frames related? Okay. How are the coordinates related? And uh, the first thing we talk about is the, the Galileo actually just there's a, these are known as transformation equations. These connecting equations are known as transformation equations. Okay, transformation equations. Okay, and there's a, there's a set of uh, transformation equations which is purely based on intuition, okay, which is uh, which seems to be obvious. It's known as Galilean transformation equations. Galilean transformation equations. Galilean transformation equations. So let's talk about Galilean transformation equations. Let's uh, talk about Galilean transformation equations. So Galilean transformation equation, it's uh, really obvious. It seems really obvious. You can just look at this thing. Okay. Let's say this is S and this is S prime. All right, I, I you need not draw the z axis. Okay, and let's say this uh, we, we name the coordinates like this this is x, y, and z. This is x prime, y prime, and uh, okay, z prime. And you have got an object here. Right now, what are the coordinates in S? What are the coordinates of this particle in S? Okay, we talk about the x coordinate, it's this length. Okay, the x coordinate is this length. Am I right? Okay, the x coordinate is this length, y coordinate is this, and z coordinate is this. And let's say that the s prime frame is moving along the x direction. All right, for simplicity, let, for simplicity, let's assume that this s prime frame is moving along the x direction, along the x direction. Okay, with a velocity v, it has a velocity v. Right. And what about x? So what about x prime? So this, if this distance is x, okay, this distance is x prime. That distance is x prime. Am I right? Is that fine? Yes, sir. All right. Now let's assume that at t equal to zero, their origins coincide. Okay, let's assume that at t equal to zero, their origins coincide. Then what's this distance? This distance is just v t because it's moving at a velocity v, and in time t it would have moved away distance v t. Okay, can yeah, v t. Okay. So from here you get the transformation equations easily. You see that x prime it's this length it's equal to x minus vt right? this whole length minus this one so it's equal to x minus vt and in this case y prime and z prime remain the same okay and there's another ingredient to this okay so we, we also said that we need to we need to have a clock in your reference frame, right you need to have a clock in your reference frame okay so galileo simply assumed because the, it's according to your experience galileo simply assumed that t prime equal to t these are known as Galilean transformation equations. Transformation equations. Okay. All right. Now, from this, you also can have the Galilean. How do the velocities transform? All right. Galilean uh, law. Let's call it as a Galilean law for velocity addition. So you just take time derivative on both sides and you see that if there's a particle, okay, if, if the velocity is u x prime, the x component of velocity is in the x, uh, in the s prime frame is u x prime. And in the other frame, it's u x, then you see that u x prime is equal to u x minus v. You take just the time derivative. And we said that v is a constant. Okay, now this is understandable. Okay, this is understandable because uh, yeah, u x prime is equal to u x minus v. Okay. Okay. So u x prime is the velocity of this object in the s prime frame. Okay. This is u x prime. It's with respect to this s prime frame. Okay. It's with respect to this s prime frame. Okay. And uh, 
And, but when you, when you look at it from the S frame, when you look at it from the S frame, you see that the total speed is the, the velocity with respect to S prime frame plus the velocity of the S prime frame, right? That's what we get here. You see that Ux equal to Ux prime. This is the velocity with respect to the S prime frame, but S prime frame itself has a velocity V, right? So Ux is equal to Ux prime plus V. These things we know, we are familiar with. Similarly, these equations do not change. Okay, u prime, ui prime is equal to ui and uz prime is equal to uz. Okay, these are known as Galilean law for velocity addition. This, these are really obvious. Okay, these are really obvious because simply we can talk about this thing. Suppose there's a bus moving at a velocity v, okay, or a train moving at a velocity v, okay, and there's a person, right? There's a person inside, there's a person inside who's sitting on the train, all right? So what's the speed of the person with respect to another frame? So this person is at rest. Let's call this as S prime frame. This person is at rest with respect to S prime frame. So from outside, okay, from outside, you look at, you use some other frame S. Okay? And from this S frame, you see that this person is not at rest. He's moving at a speed V, okay? Now, if this person is walking with a speed U, right, with respect to a train, in train, he's just walking. But from outside, you'll see that his total speed is simply V plus U. So this is really an intuitive, this Galilean law for addition of velocities is really intuitive, okay? All right. Now we also have, okay, this concept was not well developed earlier, but it's called by the nice name, Galilean relativity. Okay, Galilean relativity. We talk also about Galilean relativity. So Galilei already had this uh, idea of relativity in a way that it, it says that the laws of mechanics, okay, at that time, he, they only had laws of mechanics, all right? So laws of mechanics are the same, are the same in all inertial reference frames. So this is known as uh, Galilean relativity. <clears throat> now this can be easily seen. This means that, see, so, so for example, you can take the Newton's equation as a representative for the, the laws of mechanics, all right? You'll see that Newton's, Newton's equation does not change when you go from one inertial frame to another, okay? This means that if you do any experiment in mechanics, okay, if, if you have a complete uh, lab inside your reference frame. You don't. You, you cannot look outside. Okay, you may be inside a train or you may be inside a ship, but you have a whole uh, experimental system where you can do experiments in mechanics. Okay, and since the laws of mechanics are the same, you really cannot detect your motion if you are moving at a constant uh, speed. You cannot really detect your motion. You cannot know whether you are moving or not by doing experiments in mechanics. All right, you can have a simple pendulum. You can measure the periods. You will see that everything uh, will be exactly the same. So actually, Galileo brought, for, brought this forward to uh, defend the idea that Earth is actually moving, you know, that Earth is actually going around the sun. So people asked then, why don't we detect it? Okay, the answer is Galilean relativity. We wouldn't know whether it's moving or not, because movement, or in other words, movement is relative. Okay. So if you look at the Newton's equation, for example, if you look at the Newton's second law, okay, in the S prime frame, let's write in the S prime, S, S prime frame, dx prime square by dt square is equal to f prime. And let's say f, that's a force, right? Okay. M dx prime square by dt square is equal to f. This is Newton's uh, law. Of, uh, this is this is the law, this is a representative for the laws of mechanics. All right. Now, if you make this transformation, right? You make the Galilean transformation. You know, if you go to the s s frame, okay? How does x prime and x, x how is x prime and x related? You see that x prime is equal to x minus vt, okay? So dx prime by dt is equal to dx by dt minus v, all right? What about dx, d square x prime by dt square? That's equal to d square x by dt square minus zero because v is a constant, all right? So you see that d square x prime by dt square in the new frame, this becomes d square x by dt square. This is equal to f. Right. You see that the equation of motion does not change. It has, whether you are in one S, S frame or S prime frame, as long as they are inertial frames, you see that the equations of motion do not change. You have exactly the same laws of mechanics in both the frames. 
okay this is known as galilean relativity in other words you cannot really detect your motion without uh, reference to anything else okay this means that the what you call as velocity it's actually relative some uh, with respect to some frame you may be moving and with respect to some other frame you may not be moving so this movement or uh, motion okay especially in this case the motion in straight lines and constant velocities is a relative concept okay it has no absolute meaning motion has no absolute meaning okay this is known as the galilean relativity okay. so things were all good at this time there was mechanics there was uh, there were newton's laws and things were all good okay but then slowly they saw that there were some other objects all right newton's laws basically talked about material objects okay material objects or material point particles something like that okay but things were not all fine and uh, soon okay there were the people identified that there are also things called fields okay because uh, Hertz did all these experiments, and other people they realized that there are other uh, objects or there are other entities called fields. For example, if you take a magnet, okay, and uh, if you bring another magnet towards it, you'll see that there is either attraction or a repulsion. Okay, this repulsion is rather dramatic because they are not really touching. So what is whatever is in between them, it's called as a field. Okay, and people found that. Uh, okay, uh, I mean Faraday people. Fire, people like faraday all right experimentally found that we can talk about electric field the electric fields magnetic fields okay and uh, faraday actually showed that they can be converted to each other so we talk about an electromagnetic field etc electromagnetic field okay there is a relation between them right and uh, people at that time thought that all right we we have just we don't have just particles there are also fields we can also understand it in a way Uh, in a mechanical way right in a newtonian way we can understand them and uh, maxwell actually came up with equations which uh, are obeyed by this field so right equations that govern these fields and these are known as maxwell's equations all right so if you lo look at electromagnetism you have a different set of laws which are known as or electrodynamics which are known as maxwell's equations we have not which is which is known as maxwell's equations okay i'll just uh, write it here for the sake of completeness del dot e is equal to rho by epsilon 0 and uh, del dot b is equal to 0 means that there are no magnetic monopoles and del cos e is equal to minus do b by do t mu 0 j 1 by c square something like that we have got this maxwell's equations right and uh, the problem with these equations all right it was immediately identified that these equations had a small problem okay right what happens is that if you look at them all right if you if you do the galilean transformation if you do a galilean transformation or if you go from one frame to another if you go from one frame to another if you go from one inertial frame to another by the galilean transformation equations then you see that the maxwell's equations actually change form maxwell's equations change their form okay but the newton's equations remain the same so it seems that by doing experiments in electromagnetism we can actually identify whether we are moving or not right this uh, seemed a bit problematic and there's a dramatic uh, demonstration of this if you look at for example you know that the electromagnetism or the laws of electromagnetism admit electromagnetic waves but right? this laws admit electromagnetic waves electromagnetic waves right and uh, maxwell's equation says that this electromagnetic waves travels at a speed c is equal to 1 by square root of epsilon 0 mu 0 so it's equal to 3 into 10 raised to 8 meter per second All right and you, if you look at this this is a constant all right these are constants these are constant quantities okay so instead of uh, all these things we can talk about the law of propagation of light we can call this as the law of propagation of light of electromagnetic waves or law of propagation of light okay now you know that if you make a galilean transformation you know that if you make a galilean transformation to another frame you know that the 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 speed 
in another inertial frame, all right? By the law of Galilean addition, if you are looking at this beam of light from a frame which moves at a speed v, okay? Galilean law of addition of velocity says that you will have c minus v, all right? The speed of electromagnetic wave would be c minus v. Suppose you have an electromagnetic v, electromagnetic wave going like that, and you are measuring the speed of the electromagnetic wave from a frame which is moving parallelly at a speed v, all right? And Galileo, say, Galileo says that the velocity of the light with respect to this frame would be c minus v. All right, that's what Galileo says. All right, but there is no c minus v in here. All right, it's here. It says that uh, the speed of light is a constant. Okay, now this is a serious problem, and people thought that all right, this electromagnetism is rather new. There may be something wrong with the electromagnetism. The equations may not be complete, so they need some sort of modification. Okay, so for the time being, people said that all right, let's say that this is true only in a particular frame in a particular frame, okay? So you say that the speed of light is this, C is equal to three into 10 raised to eight meter per second. And uh, just before sometime we said that if you talk about speed, if you talk about movement, you have to talk with respect to what, all right? Now people ask, right? You say that C is equal to three into 10 raised to eight meter per second, then with respect to what? In which frame? With respect to what? Or in which frame? All right. So at that time, uh, people found a way out. They said that, uh, so there was this concept of ether uh, from uh, uh, earlier times. People thought about some universal medium called ether. So Maxwell just brought in this concept of ether. This is an old concept, okay? But Maxwell just brought it in and he said that this speed, okay, this speed is with respect to ether. The speed, so 3 into 10 raised to 8 meter per second is with respect to ether. Okay, this means that Maxwell is actually saying that there is a, uh, there is this ether is known as an absolute rest frame, absolute rest frame. Okay, so Maxwell is actually saying that these laws of electromagnetism are true only in a given in a special frame, which is at absolute rest and it's called as ether. All right, so Maxwell's equation is actually saying that there is a preferred frame, there is a preferred frame, and in other frames, in other frames. The laws of electromagnetism will be different, right? So this says that there is a particular class of frame, or there's a particular frame in which the laws of electromagnetism is correct, and there are other in all other frames which are moving with respect to it, the laws of electromagnetism do not work, right? So there are correct frames and wrong frames for electromagnetism. That's how uh, Maxwell actually got out of the problem initially. Okay, is this is this part fine? Is there any doubt? No, sir. Okay, this is the point where Einstein comes along. Einstein comes along, and uh, he is a bit uh, serious about this relativity business. All right, he says that all right, this is not nice. Okay, we shouldn't be able to detect motion. So maybe there is something wrong with Maxwell's laws of electromagnetism. So Einstein and other people actually tried. Okay, tried to modify Maxwell's equations in such a way that they obey the Galilean relativity. Okay, they obey the Galilean relativity. But they saw that there was no other way to formulate the laws of electromagnetism in a consistent manner. This is the correct way, right? No other consistent manner in which it is consistent with Galilean relativity is possible. And also it was very consistent with the experimental results, okay? But what Einstein found was that, Einstein also observed that, uh, Maxwell's equation. Maxwell's equation give the correct numerical result. Numerical result even when applied to wrong frame. Okay, even in moving frames, if you if we say that uh, the Maxwell's equations are valid in the frame. Right? Einstein actually noticed that even in a wrong frame, okay, which Maxwell called as wrong, okay, the, the description may be different. Right? What a person calls an electromagnetic electric field, another person may call a combination of electric and magnetic field. All right? So their description of the physics is different, but they, are, they all measure the same numerical quantity. Right? They all predict the same numerical result. Okay? So it seems that Maxwell's equations really does not distinguish, or Maxwell's equations really do not distinguish between 
uh, different frames which are moving it because you cannot if, if they are numerically same right if the results are numerically same you really cannot know whether you are moving or not right and again a dramatic uh, the, the, the dramatic what do you say the demonstration of this was the michelson morley experiment michelson morley experiment okay so they say that all right the, the, the maxwell says that c is the speed of light in a specific frame called rest frame so if you measure the speed of light from a different frame which is moving you should find a different velocity right for example to put it in a very simple manner you have got earth which is rotating okay so the michelson and morley said that let's measure the speed of light in the direction of earth's motion in the direction of earth motion and in perpendicular direction in perpendicular direction okay so if the the if in if in the direction the the, the velocity of earth is sub v then they expected that this velocity would be c minus v and this would be c and by calculating the difference they could actually detect movement okay we could actually actually detect the movement of earth through ether okay so the this is a scheme this is an idea in order to test Maxwell's equations. Maxwell's equation says that it is true only in a particular frame, okay? Which means that you can actually detect whether you are moving or not by doing an electromagnetic experiment. For example, you can try to measure the speed of light, okay? This says that the speed of light C is equal to 310 raised to meter per second only in a rest frame, right? So if you, if you measure the speed of light and actually get some other value other than 310 raised to 8 meter per second, you can detect motion. So Michelson and Morley wanted to detect the motion of Earth through ether, and uh, they were very confident about their arrangement. It was very ingenious. It was very precise. But they found that in whichever direction you find the, uh, the speed of light, it is the same. Okay, in all directions, the speed of light is the same. So this Michelson Morley experiment had a negative result. Negative result. Right. Now this is the story of uh, special theory of relativity. Okay. Now it has a negative result, but people did not know how to understand this negative result. Right? People at that time did not know how to understand this negative result. All right, uh, but it's not really clear whether Einstein was familiar with this Michelson model experience. For Einstein, the theoretical reasons was sufficient in order to come to the special theory of relativity. Okay, but before going on to the next stage, before coming to Einstein, there's another important thing. It's called Lorentz. Okay, so 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 this is H. A. Lorentz. He was also working with this electromagnetism. Again, a very important person in physics. All right, so he actually found that these equations also have a symmetry. These equations also have a symmetry. Okay, he didn't know why what the reason for the symmetry was. Right. Uh, so he saw that just like Newton's equations remain the same under Galilean transformations, Maxwell's equations also has a symmetry. Okay, there is a certain class of transformations that you can do to coordinates okay, that will leave these equations invariant or these equations the same in the same form. Okay. So Lorentz actually played around this with these equations, and he found that if you make this particular transformation, right, x prime is equal to, at this point, it's purely mathematical. where this gamma is one by square root of one minus V square by C square. But right? we'll uh, use this gamma very often. It's one by one minus V square by C square, right? But for no particular reason, okay? Mathematically, uh, Lorentz showed that this uh, Maxwell's equation also have a certain symmetry, okay? It's, it's, it's this transformation. If you make this transformation instead of the Galilean transformation, then Maxwell's equations have the same form. Okay, Lorentz did not know what this means. It's purely mathematical at this point. Okay, so he just realized that this uh, laws of electromagnetism also have a symmetry. Okay, it's known as Lorentz symmetry or Lorentz transformation symmetry. Okay. And you see that this time is also related in a weird way. All right, it seems that the time in different frames is the same. Okay? And uh, the corresponding inverse transformations can be obtained by, you know, you just put V by minus V. 
the inverse transformation. So if uh, the inverse transformations are also there, you just put V by minus V and you, wherever there's prime, you remove the prime and wherever there's no prime, you give the prime, all right? So that, give, that gives the inverse transformation, X equal to gamma X prime plus VT prime, Y equal to Y prime, Z equal to Z prime, and T is equal to gamma T prime plus V by C square X prime, all right? And uh, there's a really, okay, this is nice. And we'll be doing this Lorentz transformation equation. So, right, so at this point, we are not interpreting it. We'll give the physical interpretation the next step. Okay, we'll just uh, talk about this Lorentz transformation equations. Okay. And in order to solve the problems, okay, it's, uh, the, uh, there's a particularly useful form because this coordinate. These coordinates themselves are not physical, right? Only coordinate differences are physical. What you can measure are not the coordinates, but uh, what observers agree or disagree on are the, the physical quantities are the difference between two coordinates. Because if you say T2 minus T1, right? What's the time interval between two events? These coordinates are arbitrary. You can choose any coordinate, but the physical things are difference between these coordinates. So right? we'll call it as delta X and delta T. So how do the difference between these coordinates change? It's easy because these are uh, these kinds of transformation. You see that delta x prime is equal to, you just put a delta everywhere, right? But we'll be using this in problems. This is very handy. In this form, it's very handy. Otherwise, you'll have to do T2, you have to do all this transformation and then calculate the difference separately, all right? So you remember these things for the problem. Delta x prime equal to gamma, delta x minus V delta T, delta y prime is equal to delta y, delta z prime equal to delta z and delta t prime is equal to gamma delta t minus v by c square delta x okay we there are many problems using Lorentz transformations we'll be doing them okay. we will be doing them uh, but at this point we it, it's just mathematical right and only einstein uh, gave a physical reason for the physical interpretation for this Okay, you, can, you may be already able to imagine what this physical interpretation is, but we'll come to that. Okay. Now, if you look at this, this uh, equations, okay, it looks a bit difficult, but there's a really nice symmetry between X and T. Right? There's a nice symmetry between X and T. So in order to see that, let's put beta equal to V by C. Okay, let's put beta equal to V by C. Okay, and then you see that X prime is equal to Right, x prime is equal to, uh, where was it? I think I removed it. Right. You see that the equation becomes x prime equal to gamma x minus beta ct. Right. Or let's write the inverse transformation. Let's write the inverse transformation. Okay, just put beta equal to v by c. You see that x equal to gamma x prime plus, right? This is v, but we, we, have, we are going to write this in terms of beta. Okay, so this V is actually beta C. So you said this is equal to beta CT, right? And uh, Y is equal to gamma. So there's no gamma, it's just Y prime. Z equal to Z prime, okay? And you see that uh, you V by C equal to, you put V by C equal to beta. Right? So you see that T is equal to T prime plus beta by C x prime or we can multiply throughout by c or we can write that ct is equal to ct prime plus beta x prime okay you see that there's a nice symmetry between t and x all right so if you take ct here in this term you take ct and x prime right and if you interchange x prime with ct if you interchange x prime with ct you get this equation right this is true also for the Lorentz transform we are, we are talking about the inverse Lorentz transformation here now, which transformation you call inverse and which you call Lorentz transformation is completely arbitrary. Okay, it's your choice. So it doesn't really matter which transformation you are taking, right? Because if you say that uh, this is going in a speed V, then this observer will say that, all right, my transformation is Lorentz transformation and the other one is going at a speed minus V. All right, so it's, uh, you don't have to worry whether the transformation is inverse or not. All right? You see that there's a nice symmetry between X prime and uh, CT, X prime and CT. Okay. So this is good. And it tells us something. It tells us something. It says that uh, CT is the correct coordinates that we need to 
discuss all right the time coordinate is not exactly t but it is ct and you see that ct has a nice property the ct has a nice property in that it has dimensions of length dimensions of length because c has dimensions of velocity okay t has dimension of time so this ct has a dimension of uh, length okay all right so it's a nice way to remember the lorentz transformation uh, if you remember only this one the other one is automatically obtained okay so let's uh, talk about einstein and the special theory of relativity okay so this is a very brief and uh, you know simple a brief uh, explanation of special theory of relativity we are just touching the the very fundamental ideas all right so that you get a conceptual clarity all right <coughs> All right, so Einstein observed these things. Okay, Einstein actually tried to change the laws of electromagnetism, and he found that no other, he found that no other consistent formalism is possible for laws of electromagnetism. Okay. So it showed, it, he also observed that the loss of electromagnetism, the loss of electromagnetism predicted correct experimental results even in wrong, okay, I wrote, put wrong in inside quotes, wrong frames, okay. So what are correct frames and wrong frames? Correct frames are those which is at rest with respect to ether and wrong frames are which are moving okay okay <clears throat> and it you can also put this experimental evidence suggests experimental evidence suggests that okay results of electromagnetic experiments do not distinguish between state of rest and uniform motion. Okay, an example I gave you the example. It's the Michelson Morel experiment. There are many other examples. Okay, so Michelson Morel experiment is. If you measure a different speed, you would be able to distinguish between state of rest and state of uniform motion, but it's a negative result, right? In whichever frame you are measuring the speed of light, the experimental results studies suggest that you'll always get the speed C, okay? So now Einstein had to make sense of all these things, okay? He wanted to keep relativity and he knew that Maxwell's, it's clear that Maxwell's equations are really correct, okay? It's consistent and he also saw that even though it seems to distinguish between state of rest and state of motion, okay, the experiments, experimental results do not distinguish between state of rest and state of uniform motion. So Einstein came to the conclusion that Maxwell's equations are actually correct, are actually correct, okay. And what's wrong? So there's something wrong with the laws of mechanics, right? So actually what he found, okay, he didn't actually put it in this way, what he found that, found was that the correct the correct transformation equations, the tra correct transformation equation between inertial frames, okay, are Lorentz transformation equations and not Galilean transformation equations. All right. So this is a, an important uh, realization that he came to. He said that the correct transformation equation between inertial frames are Lorentz transformation because Lorentz already had found these transformations. So the Lorentz transformation is the correct transformation between inertial frames. Okay? And he also observed that if you take V much less than C, take the Lorentz transformation and V much less than C and you get Galilean transformation. Okay, V much less than C, all right. 
Now Einstein put it in a different way. He took the speed of light as a postulate. Right? Okay? So he, so, so Einstein, uh, so considering all this, Einstein came up. He didn't put it exactly in this way. Okay, but what Einstein did was that he postulated two things. Okay, the, the first thing was that the same laws of physics, the same laws of physics, apply to all inertial reference systems. This is the first postulate. This is the first postulate. And the second postulate is that the speed of light in vacuum, the speed of light in vacuum is the same, is the same for all inertial observers, for all inertial observers, regardless regardless of the motion of the source. Okay, in other words, the speed of light is a constant for all observers, all right? Now, this thing, right, the speed of light is a constant for all uh, frames. Einstein came to this conclusion because he wanted relativity to be correct, right? He wanted the principle of relativity to be correct because it's not nice that different inertial frames have different laws of physics, all right? This means that if you think about it, all right, Earth is moving around the sun, and you know that at different points, it has different velocities, right? The Earth has different, when it is closer to the sun, it has a faster velocity, when it's farther away, it moves slower, you know this, this okay? This means that different times of the year, right? different times of the year, you would have to use different laws of physics, all right? So just imagine that the laws of physics are different in different inertial frames, all right? And suppose Earth, you know that Earth is moving, or Planets are moving, right? Earth is moving about the focus. The sun is in one of the focus, okay? And do you know that at this point, the velocity is high? At this point, the velocity is high. And at this point, this velocity is rather small, okay? And if the laws of physics are different in different inertial points, it means that, okay, you, you would have to use different laws of physics in different uh, times of the year. In, in April, May, you'll have to use a different set of results. And December, January, you'll have to use a different set of uh, Loss of physics. This is not nice, right? this is not a beautiful picture. Okay. And there's this momentum conservation, etc. And Galilean principle of relativity seemed to be really successful. So Einstein said that all right, you cannot discard this principle of relativity. You have to keep the principle of relativity. The same laws of physics uh, apply in all inertial reference frame. Okay. And he has an extra thing, all right? And he's actually realizing that okay, the Newton's equations have some problem. The correct equations are Maxwell's equations. Right? So when you say that the correct equations are Maxwell's equations, there is this law of propagation of light. Law of propagation of light. Maxwell's equation also says about this law of propagation of light, which says that light is traveling at uh, speed, constant speed, uh, c is equal to one by square root of epsilon zero, mu zero. Right? So he says that, he's actually basically saying here that the laws of uh, electromagnetism are correct, okay? or the law of propagation of light is a fundamental fact of nature. Right? So the speed of light has to be constant. Okay, and uh, this also can be in the, given in a different way. You can say that, all right, the same laws of physics apply in all inertial reference system. Okay, now what are the transformation equation between inertial reference system? Okay, the second postulate also can be put like this. The correct, this actually means that the correct transformation law between inertial frames is the Lorentz transformation equations. All right, that's the Lorentz transformation equations. All right, this is actually the meaning of the second postulate. Okay, but Einstein did it in a different way. He actually postulated this because he looked at the law of propagation of light. And by demanding that C is a constant, by demanding that C is a constant in all frames, he actually derived the Lorentz transformation equations. He actually derived the Lorentz transformation equation. Okay, so if you take this as the postulate, then Einstein asked, "What are the transformations that leave the speed of light invariant? What are the transformations that leave the speed of light invariant?" And he found that there are a class of transformations that leave the speed of light invariant, and it is known as Lorentz transformation equations. And Einstein actually derived it in a much easier way than Lorentz. Okay, it's uh, really ingenious. Okay. All right, so this is special theory of relativity. This is special theory of relativity.
now in the next class we'll do problems using Lorentz transformation equations because we have the Lorentz transformation equations there okay and slowly we'll see some consequences and then uh, we'll uh, after doing some problems and then we'll move on to the geometry geometrical picture or the Minkowski geometry okay so questions have been uh, questions have been asked from this Minkowski geometry directly all right directly it has been asked and uh, so we'll need to discuss it in, in any case it's nice to understand these things this is a special theory of relativity is fundamental to all of modern physics okay so it's a good thing to have a deep understanding about special theory of relativity all right actually special theory of relativity is also a law that governs all the laws of physics all right it says that if you have a law of physics it has to be uh, it has to remain the same it has to be Lorentz covariant it should have the same form under Lorentz transformations Okay, so if you look at standard model or quantum field theory, all these things are laws of physics which are consistent with the uh, special theory of relativity. So you can say that special theory of relativity is a law that governs. So this is very important, this is fundamentally important. Okay, all laws of physics. Okay, not actually all laws of physics. Uh, gravity is an exception, but you can say it. it's a uh, it has to be at least consistent to all laws of physics have to be at least consistent to special theory of uh, relativity. Okay, In next class we'll start uh, with doing some example problems. We'll derive the uh, Einstein law for velocity addition and we'll do some problems using Lorentz transformation. And then we'll move on to uh, geometry. So example, one of the questions that was asked in uh, I think previous net exam or before that, okay. So we, in uh, special theory of relativity, we talk about the space time. Okay, we take one axis as time and one axis as space. Okay, so the question is this, this is X and T. Suppose if, this is the question, we'll see the answer to this question, all right? Suppose there's another frame moving at a speed V with respect to this frame, all right? What do the coordinates of this observer look like in this coordinate system? What do the coordinates of this observer uh, uh, this uh, system look like in this coordinate system, right? And the options are given like that. This is one option, and this is another option, okay? All right, this is T, X. So what are the coordinates? So these options are given, all right? And uh, you will have to answer. This is another option like that, okay? And uh, such questions after dealing with the geometrical picture, we'll be easily able to answer such questions. Okay. Also, if you come to geometrical questions, you can uh, solve more problems in a much easier manner. Okay. All right. But we'll come to that. In the next session, we'll solve problems. And uh, after completing this problem, so Lorentz transformation is important with respect to examination. All right? There are problems from Lorentz transformation that's always asked. So we'll do some problems. Also, there are problems for velocity addition, etc. Okay. And then uh, we'll move on to the next section. Tomorrow will be a problem session based on the theory that we discussed today. Okay, are there any questions? Are there any doubts, conceptual or otherwise? No, sir. Thank you.